We continue in our series of the Sermon of the Mount. And this is one of the uh, very important scripture in the Bible, especially in this Sermon of the Mount, as the Lord Jesus were dealing with the people of Israel, the people of God, to be real members of the kingdom of heaven, real members of the kingdom of God. Now, I titled this sermon today, uh, In God We Trust. And it's important for us to understand that we cannot trust someone that we do not know. You can trust only something or someone that you know and if you don't know that person or you don't know that thing you cannot put your trust on it or on that person the same way when the Americans or fathers they established the constitution of the American government they in their bills, in the currency, coins and bills, they put this sentence, in God we trust. Now, you all heard news these days in media, in, on TV, that they are preparation of elections in America. And we can follow the news and see that this year, especially in, in many countries, those who are raising uh, uh, campaigns for elections for president, they, in this time of period of history, they have very um, different attitude than before in different campaigns. And that's made us think what's going on in the world, what's happening in the world, that we cannot see some kind of manners, attitudes, behaviors that we used to see in this kind of campaigns. And now everything looks like out of control. Everything looks like out of standards. And even though we have some or another appreciation for one or another candidate in this or any campaigns of election in any country, we have to still trust God. God is in control. Even though we don't like this candidate or that candidate or what he say or what did not say, doesn't matter how is the process of this election at the end. It will, it will be God's will to select the person who will run the people, his people, for the next years. In Peru, where I come from, we have elections last uh, uh, spring. And then, during the campaigns of these uh, final two candidates, because they were uh, first election with more than five candidates and at the end those who were on the top of the uh, rates of the elections they decided to do it again for a final uh, election and then during the these campaigns of three weeks approximately or maybe a little more I don't remember exactly the candidates they were using a, a, a kind of language that instead to promote the country or promises, like usually in previous years, what we only listen for candidates were only promises. Now, in Peru, we didn't listen much promises, but what we listened were more criticisms from the, from the other party for the, against the other candidates. Instead to talk about what they're going to do or what, what, what exactly they're going to uh, start to war, they start to accuse each other for being 
in the past in this way or another way. And they use some kind of language that it shouldn't be used in public. It was too offended, too personal, too, too much for people who want to have leaders or representatives in government uh, reflect the heart and the attitude of the, the entire nation. And since the, those who want to be president of any country use that kind of expression or languages, you can imagine what's going to happen with the rest of the country. What kind of freedom, what kind of, what kind of uh, uh, unlimited uh, behaviors we can perform. And the, the very reason is that we are not conscious that when we are in a position of leadership, we are not serving ourselves. And God is not serving us, but God is using us to serve others. And if we lost that perspective of mind, we can be very selfish. And we can think that we are under cover or we are under control because God bless us. And since God bless us, we can do whatever we want. This is what happened in the New Testament. When Jesus was preaching about his sermon, the people of Israel, they thought that, and the leaders of Israel, they saw that since they were under the blessing of God, they can do whatever they wanted. They can say whatever they wanted. They can behave in the way they, they wanted. And when Jesus came, Jesus confronted them in their behaviors, in their words, and also in their hearts. And that's why the leaders of Israel, they reject Jesus, they criticize Jesus, and they kill Jesus. When the Lord was on this world, he said these very words that we used for this year 2016 campaign in CA. The time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. Jesus wanted to see that the people of Israel, they need it right now, a reform. They need, they need it right now a change, a dramatical change. They need to come back to God, turn from the wickedness, from the sinfulness, turn back from the idolatry, from self-confidence and self-righteousness life, to God, to God's righteousness and kingdom's righteousness. And because the people of Israel, they didn't put the trust in God as they should put. They put the trust in other things, government, business, and even tradition. And as we're going to study today, in the law of the Book of Moses, or the Torah. We study at the beginning of this year, in 2016, here in CN, the kingdom's virtues. And we talk that, yes, the first thing that characteristic the kingdom of God is truth. And without truth, we cannot show to people who are coming to God, who are coming to the kingdom of God, the platform, the bridge for trusting God. Because if you see a person that is not trustworthy, you cannot follow that person. You cannot put your life in their hands. And the same way, if we don't believe what God said is trustworthy, we cannot put our life on in God's promises, in God's law. So, the Bible is the love of God. The Bible is the word of God. And this is the manual of Christian and kingdom's life. Without this book, we cannot live, as we call ourselves, Christians. Now, the question is, do we trust that this book is 100% truth. Do we trust that everything that he's saying in this book is truth? And if it is truth, are we obeying? 
I mean, do we believe? Do we obey? Do we follow what it says? How we can live a life of Christianity without know how the Christian life is like or how the, the, the people of God should live if we don't read the Bible? If we don't understand what God wants us to do, be, and perform. These words are the words of God. And in the time of Jesus, they have the books of the Old Testament. They have also the Torah, that is called the law. And they have also other books, like the, the Talmud, that they are the books of traditions. They were adding more laws for the people of Israel to identify among the nations that were living in a different way as a people of God, as a chosen people. Actually, there were like 630 laws in the Bible or in the tradition of, of, of the, the Jews to follow and to obey. These traditions and these laws that the scribes, they created, and the leaders of Israel, they use it to, to strengthen their culture. They try to show to the world they have a different culture. And they would try to be uh, proud of that culture. As we say the last week, they were the zealots who tried to, to make revolts by force. Now, the, 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 the Pharisees, the, the, the scribes, the, the Sadducees, they tried to, to show a different kind of revolution. They try to show that they are keeping a law. Not the law of the Roman Empire, but the law of the culture, the nation, the nation of Israel. Now for us, for Christians, we know that the Bible, yes, from cover to cover is God's word and is for us as Christians, our law. Who gave us this law? It's God himself. We read Exodus 24, 12 says, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tables, the tables of stones with the law and commands I have written for their instructions. So who is the lawgiver? It's God. He gave it to Moses, the writer of the Bible. The tradition said that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Do you know what is the first five books of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's what the tradition said, that Moses wrote these five books of the Bible. They call it the Pentateuch. They call it the Torah. They call it the Law. Now, when Jesus came, he preached about grace. And that's why John, in his, in his first chapter, in his book, said that for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we see here two sins. The law that is given by God through Moses and the grace that is given by God through Jesus. And not only grace, but grace and truth. That is the first virtue of kingdom's life. The problem was, is that as I say, the leaders of Israel, different like the zealots who, were, who tried to, to take everything by force, to use the force in order to conquer and, 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 and achieve their goals, the Israel leaders, they used legalism in order to achieve their agenda. Yes, legalism comes from the word legal, that it means law. So they Leaders of Israel, they were emphasizing in keeping the law, even though they couldn't keep in the law. And they were push, pushing to the people of Israel so much pressure to keep the law, even though they didn't keep the law. Now, this, is what, this was rebuked by the Apostle Paul when he met Peter, who was one of the disciples of Jesus. You know Peter, the one who, who, who jumped into the sea and walked on waters, the one who betrayed Jesus three times, and also who was called by Jesus to love him and to take care of his sheep. Yes, in the book of Acts, we see that Peter, he went to visit the, the cities of Mino Asia, and then one of them, they 
he have an encounter with the Apostle Paul in Galatia. And this was in Galatians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul read like this about legalism. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposite to him face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, James was the, the pastor of Jerusalem, was the brother of Jesus. He used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The circumcision group was the Judas, Jude, uh, Judaist party, the people of Jerusalem who came from Judea, the Jews, who were declaring that we are, Christ, uh, we are uh, God's people because we are circumcised. That is different with the Gentiles, the other nations that they didn't circumcise. So according to the covenant of Abraham, every, first, uh, every baby, male baby, have to be circumcised on the eighth day after they were born. And that's why they declared people of God. So all the Jews that were proud that they were called the people of God just before they, uh, just after they gave birth. And since they were identified themselves as clean people, when Peter was eating with the Gentiles who were not circumcised, they were, he was acting in order to gain the, the favor and to get fellowship with the, the, the Gentiles uh, using the, the, the same customs, eating the same food that they have in the region. But when the, the, the committee that came from Jerusalem, sent it by the pastor James, the brother of Jesus, to Galatians, then Peter started to behave different. Why? Because, oh, these are people who keep the tradition, who keep the law. So Peter started to add more like a legalist person. And then, Apostle Paul said, the other Jews joining him in his hypocrisy. So there were other Jews people who were in Galatia, who were friends of Peter, and as soon as they saw Peter behavior in the traditional way, they also say, oh, okay, chon <laughs> like you say in Korea. Okay, wake up. Let's go back to the law. And he says here, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Barnabas was the one who bring Apostle Paul into Antioch, who wants to, once again, the Apostle Paul was a persecuted Christian, so Barnabas was the, the person who introduced Apostle Paul to the, 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 the leaders of, of, of Christianity, to the Gentiles and also to the, the Jews. And even him, who was a, a person who, should be, who, who was the, the counselor of the church, who, who had a great gift of counseling, he was a great counselor. Even he was following Peter in this hypocrisy. And when I saw, says the Apostle Paul, that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I say to Peter in front of all of them, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it? Then, the Jew force Gentiles to follow Jews' customs. Then he continues saying, We who are Jews by birth, I mean by the circumcision, identify as Jews and not Gentiles, sinners, know that a man is not justified observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. What the Apostle Paul is saying, that the law is useless, that we don't need laws, that we live in anarchy, we live lawless, or what the Apostle Paul was saying that you are hypocrites because you try to live like a person who live free of the law, the law of men, but under the law of God, but in front of men, you try to please men instead to please God. You are a liar. You are a hypocrite. You are a legalist. And that's why 
when the, when the Lord Jesus, he was in Jerusalem, he opposed to the traditions and to the laws that were created from the leaders of Israel to put oppression in the people of Israel instead to keep the love of God who was, who was for who was created for the benefit of the people. The Jews created laws to put oppression, to slay the people in this legalism. God created law to give people freedom, to give people security, to give, keep people comfort, and our way of living. I mean, you can see these days, every day, when you drive your car, so you have a car, or you see someone driving, that these days, not many people, especially here in Korea, they respect the traffic lights. They, there are many people in these days, I'm including myself, that they don't respect the speed limit in the highways. Why? Because we see that, yeah, well, maybe nobody's seeing us. <laughs> or, is it okay if I excuse myself because I'm in a hurry to do something against the law? What I'm doing is just putting my life in danger and putting other people's life in danger too if I don't keep the law. If I don't respect the traffic lights, sooner or later an accident will happen to me or to someone else. That's why we have to keep the law of the traffic lights in order to be secure. God gave us the commandments to secure our life, to live in harmony to one another. And if we don't have that law, we won't be in harmony, we won't be secure, we won't be safety. But the people of Israel, the leaders of Israel, they create more laws, not to protect the people of Israel, but to make the people of Israel proud in their culture. They were legalism, and they tried to, to identified as law keepers, but instead to be law keeper, they were traditionalist, more than law keepers. They didn't use the love of God, they, they replaced the love of God with the tradition. That's why when Jesus was rebuking the, 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 the Israelites, they say, you put the tradition first and the love of God. Now, as we Christians today, we are here to Stand the kingdom of heaven in this world. This scripture is telling us this morning to be ready to understand the love of God, to understand the law of these words. Because in this world we have laws. I don't know if you have heard or you will learn later about the natural law. Natural, there are natural laws and there are laws made in by men. Now, people in this world, they understand like this. Natural laws are laws based upon principles of truth, and men's laws are based upon dogmas and belief. What does the people in this world understand about natural law and men's law? This government and any country government, they can create laws, and this law that they made it by men. But there were natural laws that they were in every culture and in every conscious of person without creating because they were already created. By who? By God. That's why we call it God's law, the moral law. We have the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. But there were more than Ten Commandments in the, the Bible to keep as followers of Christ and as followers of God. And the Jews, they knew that. So we have these laws in the Bible to follow, to respect, to obey. And that's what God expects us to, to, to do. Why? Why we need laws? And why we need God, God's law to live? Can we just live by the love of men or the natural laws that is in the planet, in this world, in this universe, without God? The answer is no. We cannot live just only by men's law 
and the love of nature. We need the love of God. Because if we don't have God's law in us, there is no reason for keeping the law. Because we don't know what is right and wrong. We don't know what is good and evil. And if this war is without God, everything is permissible. Men will change law every day and every day, and they will redefine the laws every day. That's what's happening today in the governments, especially in America. You see that one government comes from one party to another, and as soon as the party of the government is changing in, in, the, in the presidential house, the laws are changing again. The laws are redefining. And now we see the news that they say, yes, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was okay to pray in the schools. It was okay to pray in public. It was okay to have the, the Ten Commandments, monuments, or statue there in public places. And now they are removed. They say it's offended. 10 or 20 years ago, we only know that there were only two genders in, 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 in public, in the universe, male and female. Now, by these new governments and new laws, they say, we, know, we not only have two genders, but one more. And they are now ready fighting genders, laws, and culture. And who, where, behind all this new or redefining these new, redefining the laws that they were already there? It was only men without, men, men who live without God. Why? Because they have no limits for their life. Everything is permissible for them. Because there is no limit for, to, the, to define what is good or, or wrong. And for someone, something is wrong. And for the other person, the same thing is good. For some people, telling a, a lie is okay. And for other people, telling a lie is bad. So depends on the situation, people define what is right and, and wrong. Let me show you this. It's a video that we come from this It's atheism's movie. most potent weapon against the Christian not. faith, and it is. Can we turn After on all, the, the very existence of evil Just begs the question, this. if God is all good and God is all powerful, why does he allow evil to exist? The answer at its core is remarkably simple. Free will. God allows evil to exist because of free will. From the Christian standpoint, God tolerates evil in this world on a temporary basis so that one day those who choose to love him freely will dwell with him in heaven, free from the influence of evil, but with their free will intact. In other words, God's intention concerning evil is to one day destroy it. Well, how convenient. One day, I will get rid of all the evil in the world. But until then, you just have to deal with all the wars and holocaust, tsunamis, poverty, starvation, and AIDS. Have a nice life. <laughs> Next, you'll be lecturing us on moral absolutes. But why not? Professor Radisson, who's clearly an atheist, doesn't believe in moral absolutes. But his course syllabus says he plans to give us an exam during finals weeks. Now. I'm betting that if I manage to get an A in the exam by cheating, he'll suddenly start sounding like a Christian, insisting it's wrong to cheat, that I should have known that. And yet, what basis does he have? If, if my actions are calculated to help me succeed, then why shouldn't I perform them? For Christians, the fixed point of morality, what constitutes right and wrong, is a straight line that leads directly back to God. Oh. So you're saying that we need a God to be moral, that a moral atheist is an impossibility. No, but with no God, there's no real reason to be moral. I mean, there's not even a, a standard of what moral behavior is. For Christians, lying, cheating, stealing, in my example, stealing a great I didn't earn are forbidden. It's a form of theft. But if God does not exist, as Dostoevsky famously pointed out, if God does not exist, then everything is permissible. And not only permissible, but pointless. If Professor Radisson is right, then all of this, all of our struggle, our, our debate, whatever we decide here is meaningless. 
I mean, our, our lives and ultimately our deaths are of no more consequence than that of a goldfish. Come on, this is ridiculous. So after all your talk, you're saying that it all comes down to a choice. Believe or don't believe. That's right. That's all there is. That's all there's ever been. The only difference between your position and my position is that you take away their choice. You demand that they choose the box marked, I don't believe. Yes, because I want to free them. Because religion is like a, it, it, it's, it's like a mind virus that parents have passed on down to their children. And Christianity is the worst virus of all. It slowly creeps into our lives when we're weak or sick or helpless. So religion is like a disease? Yes. Yes, it infects everything. It's the enemy of reason. Reason? Professor, you left reason a long time ago. What you're teaching here isn't philosophy. It's not even atheism anymore. What you're teaching is anti-theism. It's not enough that you don't believe. You need all of us to not believe with you. Why don't you admit the truth? You just want to ensnare them in your primitive superstition. What I want is for them to make their own choice. That's what God wants. You have no idea how much I'm going to enjoy failing you. Yeah, but who are you really looking to fail, Professor? Me? Or God? All right. So, as we just see this movie, just turn on the light again. There's a choose to believe or not to believe. That there is a God who would judge everybody by their deeds, good or bad. That's why Professor Ravi Zacharias says about moral law. Whenever you try to break God's moral law, you end up breaking yourself and hurting others, all while proving his love in the, the process. As we just saw in the movie, without God, everything is permissible. And there's no point to debate anything in this law or in that law, in this governing, in that governing, because without God, we can change everything. This government will come with new laws and will change the laws that were created in the last previous government. And will continue going on. So we don't know who's going to be the next president in Korea, in the United States, or any other country. But what we can do is to pray that God will be done using any one of these presidents. That is important for today, for Christians to go to vote and to choose the president that will probably not be the best, because the best will be God, but the better, the better. Or as we say, the less worth, the less worth. Why? Because we have seen laws have been changing so far. And if we want to live a life according to God's law and God's moral, we have to, as the soul of the air, protect the correct or, or retain the correction of this world to increase. We have to put some limits as a soul of the air to say, no, more correction will spread out. That's the, 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 the characteristics of the soul. And Christians, we have to go and vote and say, no, we don't want people who will come with laws that will change the world, the world that God creates that will change genders that God create, and, the, and laws that will put your children's or your grandchildren in the future in danger. We have to be the soul of the earth to protect our family, to protect our Christianity, to protect our disciples and our friends. So we need God's law to protect us. Without God's laws, with, that is the moral law that we have, there's no morality. There's no absolutely right and wrong. Everything will be permissible and everything will be changeable. Only God's law is eternal and is unchangeable as is incorruptible. And we can trust in the, His word that is our law. So, once again, we have to understand that this is God's law. And Jesus came to this world not to change the law, but to emphasize the law, to feel the law. Because in, in, in the scripture that we just read today, the, the people were saying that, yes, now we have a second Moses. And actually, many scholars interpreted that Jesus' Sermon on the Mountains looks like 
Moses giving the law in the Old Testament, in Sinai Mountain. Moses gives us the Ten Commandments and the rest of the, co the commandments in the book of Exodus. And Jesus came with the A Beatitudes and the rest of the Sermon on the Mountain as the law for how Christians should live. They say, well, now, let's see, who have more authority, Moses' law or Jesus' law? So they have with these questions to deal with Jesus. Okay, with what authority do you teach this? Because people were saying, and you, were, you can read in the gospel, that Jesus was teaching with authority. He was, using, he was making perform, performance of miracles with authority, the authority that the, the, even the leaders of Israel didn't have. And they asked to Jesus, with what authority do you do this kind of performance, this kind of miracles? So Jesus showed authority, and that's why they say, okay, who have more authority? You, who give us new law, or Moses, who already give us the law? But Jesus said, no, I don't came to change Mo Moses' law. And even one of the law given by Moses won't be changed even from a little straw on a syllabus in the Hebrew letters. But Jesus came to fill, to cover this law with understanding, with love for the benefit of all of us. So we can summarize like this. God's law is good. And God's law is the word of God. The word of God is the law for Christian because the law is a master. Now the word master in the Greek words, it means also teacher's master. Because it teaches. And in the time when the Apostle Paul was talking about writing the law, he was using this vocabulary in Greek that the law is like a master, and this word master is like someone who have a, a person who be a disciple or a student, and he can be protected by the teacher. Actually, in those days, there were no school like this that we have today. If you are a student, like you are to, today a student probably, you have to live with your master, you have to live with your tutor, you have to live with your teacher. You have to eat with it, with him or her, no, in this case him. You have to sleep with him, you have to play with him, and you have to study with him. So you have to spend time with him. Jesus spent three years together with his disciples, living together, playing together, studying together, working together, traveling together, and probably taking bath together. It was a relationship between a master and a servant. So the law is like that. It teaches and it masters us. The law is also a mirror. Show us what we are. Show us the ethic, the ethics, sorry, the ethics of life and the Christian ethics that we should know. The law is a mat. Like we say in the Psalms, it's like a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It teaches the way. It says that lying is bad, so you shouldn't go and lie. It teaches that adultery is bad. It teaches that, yes, what doesn't please God, doesn't, is, what, what is against God's law, it should be done by Christians. And also, the law is a measure. It measures us how good and how bad we are. How more close to Jesus we are, how far to Jesus we are. As we just seen this song, by the power of his law, we know that Jesus is drawing us close to him. So we have the love of God. The love is good. The love protects us. The love masters us. The love shows us how we are spiritually. The love guides us. And the law also made us know how close we are to the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus said again in this scripture that we just read that we are here to know that he didn't come to change the law or the prophets. The law because 
teach us the way of living on God. And the prophet because he tells us all about Jesus. That he is the fulfilling of the prophets. He didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And in his life, Jesus fulfilled all these laws. Now, as Christians today, how we can apply this sermon? How can we apply this word to, or this message to our life? We have a moral law, the law of God, and we must keep it in order to represent the kingdom of heaven as the soul of the air and the light of the world. But also as members of CEN, we have to know that we have laws to go and communicate with people, God's law. We have to show to the world who have a life of darkness in these laws that are created by men or trying to live only by the natural law. And we can show that, that there's a different law, the spiritual law created by God. And we can go and talk to them about it. What we need to do is to be prepared to explain about this law. As our brother John has said in the retreat, yes, we have to be ready and prepared to show to the world a reason for our hope. And we are not ready to explain why we are keeping the law as Christians. Even though we are free, then people will be afraid to become Christian like us. We have to explain the why we are doing in this and everything that we are doing is because of love. It's because of the power of His love. You can have some kind of material as this. The spiritual laws. Have you heard of the four spiritual laws? I don't know how many of you bear interacted with people who share this kind of problem. Many years ago when I came to Korea, I just learned about the four spiritual laws. And then in one conference, they invite me even to teach about the four spiritual law. And this material that was used by navigators and the Christian Campus Crusades, they explain about what are one of the, or a few of the laws that God has, the spiritual laws that come from the kingdom of heaven. There are, of course, more in the Bible. But just for this, simple ad of going to do the good words as we say the last week what is it what is the good word that we have to do as christians is go to another person that was created by god to tell it about his creator and to tell it about that they are laws that god created for us to live and you can say have you heard of the four spiritual law they will say no then you can reply to them well, there are four spiritual laws, like we have laws in, in this world. The first law is God loves you and have a wonderful plan for your life. The second law is that man is sinful and separated from God. Therefore, he can no know and experience God's love and plan for his life. The third law is that Jesus Christ is, the, is God's only provision for man's sin and through Him, you can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. For love is that we must individually receive Jesus Christ and Savior and Lord. Then we can know and experience God's love plan for our life. So it's about all that God plans for our life. Why God, plan, God have a plan for our life? Because we were created by God. You have to go and do the good work. To go to another person created by God and say, Hey, do you know that you were created by God? Do you know that you are not your own master? Do you know that you don't have control in life and death? And sooner or later you die, you're going to die in this, in this world. And what is going to happen after that? Do you know that after you die, you're going to return to God? In one way or another. Justified it or condemn it. Which one? Do you want to face to God? Condemn it or justify it. And then you can explain about this. But once again, this is just one of the tools that the people who try to evangelize others use it. But this is not enough. 
this is not enough because people will come with more questions after they hear about this but what about this and how does it work then you have to explain that you need training you need discipleship you need to 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 search and to be aware of the law of god we know that jesus said that do not think that i have come to abolish the law or the prophet i have come to ab not to abolish but to fulfill them so moses appeared with the two tables of the commandments of god jesus appeared with the same commandments not separated that not separate us from god but to join us god it's about his heart it's about the heart of the law and the heart of the law is to show god's love to people that's why he concluded in verse 19 anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teach others to do the same will be called at least in the kingdom of heaven he doesn't say you will go to hell or he will go to hell because he's talking to christians he's talking to believers but he will say you will be the least in the kingdom of heaven because you are not doing these things you are not showing to the world you are the soul you are the light and you are not reaching people for god so they can be saved that's your good work but he said, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called it great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, in which condition do you want to face Jesus in heaven? Like the great in the kingdom of heaven or like the least in the kingdom of heaven? Okay, welcome everybody heaven. Those who didn't keep the love of Christianity, those who didn't live like Christ, in, in the Christian ethical way, this size... And those who live in the Christian ethical way in the other side. You would like to face that? You would like to enter to heaven ashamed? Of course, this won't happen. But just imagine if this could happen one day. It will be glorious the day that we just enter in heaven and we see Jesus welcome us with the, his open arms that he already did on the cross. But yes, we have to do our best. We are not just robots. We are not just here to enjoy our life and blessing that we have. We are here to stand the kingdom come to the kingdom of God and let the kingdom come. And the only way we can do that is to keep the love of God. To show to the world that yes, we are doing our best to pay back the love that we have received from Jesus. Because you will be tested in your faith you will be tested in your love for god and the only way you can be tested in your love for god in your faith is just by keeping his law keeping his commandment if you love me say jesus keep my commandments we have his commandment to show how much we love jesus do with all your effort do with all your strength with all your heart god knows your heart it's like a teacher who one day a professor in university he say in his first day to to his uh, students of christian ethics and say okay everybody reads chapter one of this book and then after that we're gonna give you a questionnaire so after they giving a time to read the, the book he gave a comprehension test and then he's, after they finish the test, they say, okay, now you turn your test, after everybody finished, and qualify your, and evaluate your own test. He didn't say, give it to the classmate so he can evaluate your test. He said, you want to evaluate your own test. And everybody evaluate their own test. I say, do your best to evaluate your own test. And everybody were putting their great in their aunties now after that he say okay so see you tomorrow and we're going to study chapter two now no, the students raise i said but professor here are our tests oh just keep it with you i already i already know that you did your best in, in evaluating your test but professor how do you know our great how do you know that we are good or we did good in our tests and then the professor answered, this test was not for me 
to know that you are good or, or bad. This test was for you to know if you are good or bad. The same thing happened with the love of God. God didn't give us the law to condemn us. Actually, the law brought us to Jesus. So every time that you see the love of God and you see that you are a sinner, you say, I need Jesus. When you show the four spiritual law to people who are out there without Jesus, they will realize that they need Jesus. After many years you were becoming Christian and living a Christian life, you will still know that you still need Jesus. So the law shows us that we need Jesus. How good and how bad Christian we are, you already know. You already are evaluating yourself. God just gives you the test. The test is here, from cover up to cover in this book. So what do you want to do this week? Let's live the kingdom life. And let's live according to God's will. Because he created and he gave us his, his law to be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Let's pray.